What happened on your worst date? The idea of a picnic had come up casually. She had mentioned in one of her texts that she loved the outdoors, that the idea of fresh air, good food and nature combined felt romantic to her. I remembered that distinctly because at that moment I thought I had found a golden ticket, a way to show her that I was not just paying attention, but that I actually cared about the little things she liked. It seemed like the perfect way to kick off what could potentially be something serious. But then July came bringing with it the kind of heat that makes you question your life choices. The air was thick, heavy with the kind of humidity that felt like a constant hug you didn't want. I was already regretting my decision, but I figured it was just nerves. She seemed really into the idea when we were planning it, and I thought, if this is what she wants, I'll make it work. The day itself wasn't promising. The sky was overcast, and the threat of rain lingered. Still, I was determined. I went all out, shopping for the perfect tablecloth, a deep red that gave off a romantic vibe. I picked out candles to add some ambience, cushions to keep us comfortable on the hard park benches, and an assortment of food I hoped would impress her. She told me she was into Latin and Caribbean cuisine, so I went to one of the best restaurants in town, spending more than I probably should have. But what can I say? I was trying hard to make a good impression. First dates are always tricky, and I figured a little extra effort wouldn't hurt. By the time I finished setting up, I felt a sense of pride. The table looked like something out of a romantic movie scene, the kind where everything falls perfectly into place, where two people connect in some magical way. I was nervous, but excited. I wanted her to see how much thought I'd put into it. I wanted her to feel special. She arrived 15 minutes late. Not terribly late, but enough to throw off my already delicate nerves. I tried to shake it off as she walked up, expecting her to greet me with enthusiasm, or at least some semblance of excitement. But there was nothing. She barely smiled as she sat down, and right away I noticed something was off. Her energy was distant, like her body was there, but her mind was somewhere else entirely. We had spent hours texting over the past week, sharing stories, making each other laugh. At least I thought we were. But as she sat across from me, it felt like I was suddenly sitting with a stranger. There was no connection, none of the chemistry I thought we had. I tried to break the ice, mentioning how I remembered her saying she loved Caribbean food, gesturing to the spread in front of us. She nodded, barely looking at me. I asked her if everything was okay, if maybe she'd prefer to sit closer to the river, hoping to shift the vibe to something more comfortable. Again, she just smiled faintly, giving me a non-committal, no, everything's fine. But it wasn't fine. She didn't touch the food. Not a single bite. The meal that I had spent so much time curating based on her preferences sat there untouched, except for the bottle of water she brought for herself. It felt like I was hosting a party no one wanted to attend. And the more time passed, the more awkward it became. I kept trying, though, because... That's what you do on a first date, right? You push through the nerves, the awkwardness, hoping that something will click. But the longer we sat there in silence, the more obvious it became that this wasn't going to work. After nearly an hour of strained silence, I couldn't take it anymore. I guess I was expecting a bit more conversation, I finally said, trying to sound casual, but knowing full well how frustrated I sounded, or at least some engagement in this. I'm sorry if this date was a bust. She looked at me. That same awkward smile plastered on her face. I'm sorry too, she said. I can see you put a lot of effort into it. Her words sounded rehearsed, polite, but devoid of any real feeling. And then, as if she hadn't already made things uncomfortable enough, she dropped the bomb. It's just, this is kind of overboard for a first date, you know? It's a little cringe, like, you're trying too hard, kind of desperate. That one hit me like a punch to the gut. I couldn't even lie. I was hurt. Every detail of this date had been tailored to her preferences. I even endured the gross, sticky atmosphere of 90-degree weather with post-storm humidity because she had wanted a pic. And yet here she was, not just dismissing the effort but labeling it as des desperate. I wanted to respond, to say something that would either defend myself or at least salvage my dignity. But I bit my tongue. What good would it do to argue at this point? She had made up her mind and no amount of explaining was going to change that. Well, I said, forcing a laugh that didn't quite reach my eyes, if you're not going to eat, I sure am. And that's exactly what I did. I went to town on the food while she sat there, 
clearly uncomfortable. After a few minutes of watching me shovel rice and chicken into my mouth, I could see she was ready to leave. But before she could, I noticed a couple sitting on a nearby swing watching the river. They looked like they were on a date too, but unlike mine, theirs seemed to be going well. And something inside me snapped. Hey, you guys hungry? I called out, surprising even myself with the offer. They looked over, surprised but intrigued. I explained the situation, without too many embarrassing details, and invited them over to join me at the table. They hesitated at first, but then the girl smiled and said, Why not? As they walked over, my date stood up awkwardly, clearly wanting no part of whatever this was turning into. She muttered a quick, I should get going, and I didn't bother stopping her. I watched her leave, feeling an odd sense of relief. Sure. The date had been a disaster, but at least it was over. And now, I had company. Two strangers who, as it turned out, were on a tight budget and couldn't afford more than a walk by the river that evening. We spent the next hour laughing, eating, and talking about everything from bad dates to random life stories. It was the most fun I'd had all day, and by the end of the night, I felt a strange sense of closure. I never heard from her again, aside from a half-hearted apology text later that evening. But I didn't respond. I blocked her number and moved on. And as fate would have it, that couple, we're still friends to this day, ten years later. The next morning, the sun was already beaming through my blinds by the time I woke up. I felt groggy, not from a hangover, but from the weight of disappointment that settled on me like a heavy blanket. I replayed the date in my head, over and over, each time wincing at the desperate comment she had made. It was a word that lingered like a bitter taste. Desperate? Really? I grabbed my phone and noticed a text. It was her, the girl from last night. The same girl who had called me desperate for putting together a thoughtful picnic. Her message was short, just an attempt at damage control. I'm sorry. That was a thing for me to say to you. A thing? That was it. After all the effort I'd put into making the evening special, she boiled it down to a simple, half-hearted apology, as if her words hadn't left a bruise. I stared at the message for a few moments, unsure of whether I should reply. Part of me wanted to say something snarky, to let her know how much she'd hurt, but the bigger part of me, tired and worn down from the night before, just wanted to let it go. There was no point in dragging it out, so I did the only thing that felt right in the moment. I blocked her number and tossed the phone onto my nightstand. It was over, and I didn't need to hear from her again. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this wasn't just about the date, it was about a deeper fear. One that had gnawed at me for a while, but I hadn't fully acknowledged. Was I trying too hard in general? Was I, in fact, desperate for connection? The word echoed in my mind like a challenge, forcing me to confront my own insecurities. I knew I wasn't some over-the-top romantic, but maybe, just maybe, I had been overcompensating. Maybe I was so eager to make a good impression that I lost sight of the reality of things. That reality was that no matter how much effort you put in, it won't mean anything if the other person doesn't see or appreciate it. I spent the rest of the morning in bed, feeling the weight of that realization settle in. The disappointment was there, yes, but so was a new sense of clarity. The date was a failure, but I wasn't. I'd done my best, and that had to count for something. And if she couldn't appreciate it, then it was her loss, not mine. After a couple of hours, I dragged myself out of bed, deciding that wallowing wasn't going to fix it. I made myself a simple breakfast, coffee, toast and scrambled eggs, and tried to shake off the gloomy mood. A couple from last night popped into my mind, and I smiled. At least something good had come from the eve. At least... I wasn't one to make friends easily, but something about that spontaneous moment had felt different. There was no pressure, no expectations, just a shared experience that somehow bonded us. As I replayed our conversations, I realized that I actually had a lot of fun with them. They were kind, funny, and completely down to earth. And they'd been the exact opposite of what my date had been. Engaged, present, and appreciative of the moment. With that thought in mind, I decided to reach out. I still had the girl's number from when we exchanged contacts the night before, and I figured, why not? What did I have to lose? I sent a quick text. Hey, hope you guys had a great rest of your night. Thanks for saving me from the world's worst first date. Let's hang out sometime soon. To my surprise, I got a reply almost instantly. Hey, yeah, we had a blast. You're hilarious. Let's definitely get together again soon. 
this time with less awkward first date vibes. I smiled at the message, feeling a little lighter. Maybe last night hadn't been a total loss after all. In fact, it felt like the universe had thrown me a curveball, but I had managed to catch it in an unexpected way. The rest of the week passed uneventful. Something had shifted inside. I wasn't dwelling on the date as much anymore. Instead, I found myself thinking about how important it was to surround myself with people who actually saw and appreciated me for who I was. Not the perfect, polished version of myself that I tried to present on first dates, but the real me, flaws and all. A few days later, I met up with the couple for drinks. We had exchanged a few texts throughout the week, and I was actually looking forward to seeing them again. When I walked into the bar, I spotted them immediately, sitting at a high-top table near the back, laughing and talking like they'd been waiting for me all along. As soon as they saw me, they waved me over, and I felt a wave of relief. It was weird how quickly I felt comfortable around them, like we had known each other for years instead of just meeting a few days ago. The evening was filled with the kind of easy conversation that I had hoped for on the date, but hadn't got. We talked about our lives, our jobs, and all the ridiculous things that had happened to us over the years. I shared more details about the disastrous date, and they laughed along with me, throwing in their own stories of bad dates and awkward encounters. It felt cathartic, like I was releasing all the pent-up frustration from that night. As the night wore on, I realized something important. I had been so focused on impressing someone I barely knew that I forgot to enjoy myself. The effort I put into that date was wasted because it wasn't appreciated. But here I was, putting in no effort at all and having the time of my life. At some point during the night, we started talking about friendship. The girl, I'll call her Amy, mentioned that she and her boyfriend Mike didn't have a lot of close friends in the city. They had only moved here a year ago and were still trying to find their footing. We should definitely hang out more, Amy said, smiling. You're one of the coolest people we've met here. Her words caught me off guard. I'd spent so much time feeling like I wasn't enough for people, especially in the dating world, that I hadn't really considered how others saw me. Thanks, I said, feeling a little awkward but genuinely touched. You guys are pretty awesome too. Mike raised his glass. Here's to new friends then. We clinked our glasses together. And for the first time in a long time, I felt like I was exactly where I was supposed to be. As the weeks passed, my connection with Amy and Mike grew stronger, almost effortlessly. We hung out more frequently, sometimes for drinks, sometimes for casual dinners, and even the occasional weekend hike. What started as an impromptu invitation to share a picnic had evolved into a genuine friendship. It was odd, in the best way possible. I hadn't expected this. Finding two people who made me feel so comfortable, so seen in such a short amount of time. In hindsight, it felt almost like fate. If that date hadn't been a total disaster, I wouldn't have been sitting there, offering my food to strangers. And if I hadn't done that, I would have missed out on something so much more meaningful than what I'd hoped to find in a relationship. I had been so preoccupied with dating, with finding a romantic connection that I forgot how fulfilling it was to have friendships, true, authentic ones. The three of us started to create our own little routines. On Wednesdays, we met up at a local pub for trivia night. On Saturdays, we rotated hosting small, laid-back dinners, where we'd take turns cooking or ordering takeout. And every Sunday morning, we went for walks by the river, the same river where I had, embarrassingly, set up that cringe-worthy first date. But this time, the setting didn't remind me of failure. It became a place where I built memories with two people who appreciated me without judgment or expectation. One Sunday morning, as we walked along the riverbank, Amy brought up something that I hadn't quite expected. You know, she began, her voice soft but curious. I've been wondering, have you thought about dating again since, you know, that picnic fiasco? I laughed, more out of surprise than humor. Honestly, not really. I mean, I guess I've thought about it, but I haven't really been trying. That whole thing kind of put me off dating for a while. Mike, walking beside us, chimed in. I get it. Dating can be brutal. But, you know, not everyone's going to be like her. Amy nodded in agreement, her expression turning thoughtful. You're right. But honestly, after everything you went, I don't blame you for taking a break. It's exhausting trying to impress people who don't appreciate you. I hadn't really vocalized it before, but hearing them say it out loud made me realize just how true it was. The pressure to impress, to be dateable, 
had drained me. I had spent so much time focusing on what someone else wanted that I hadn't even stopped to consider what I wanted. And in a way, it was freeing to not be caught up in the whirlwind of online profiles, dating apps, and awkward first encounters. I could just be myself. I guess I'm just enjoying this, you know? I said, gesturing toward the peaceful river in front of us. I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything right now. You guys are more than enough for me. Amy smiled warmly, a kind of understanding in her eyes. Well, if you ever decide to get back out there, just know that we'll be here for all the terrible date stories, she said with a laugh. Mike elbowed me lightly. Yeah, we'll even bring snacks. I chuckled at the thought, but the truth was, I wasn't in a rush. For the first time in a long time, I didn't feel the need to force it. I was happy, content in a way I hadn't expected. And that contentment grew as our friendship deepened. But as with all things, life has a way of surprising you when you least expect it. It was a random Thursday night when I received a text from an unfamiliar number. At first, I thought it was a mistake, a wrong number or some kind of spam. As I opened the message, my stomach dropped. It was her. The girl from the pic, the one who had called me desperate. Hey, I know it's been a while, but I've been thinking about you. Do you think we could talk? I stared at my phone for what felt like an eternity, trying to process what I was reading. Talk? About what? Why now, months later, was she suddenly reaching out? Part of me wanted to respond, if only to get some closure. Maybe she had realized how hurtful her words had Maybe she felt guilty. But another part of me, the part that had worked so hard to move on, knew that responding would only drag me back into something I'd already put behind me. I took a deep breath letting the tension in my shoulders melt away. I didn't need this. I didn't need her validation, her apology, or her explanations. I had moved on, not just from her, but from the idea that I needed someone else's approval to feel good about myself. I had friends who valued me for who I was, and that was enough. Without a second thought, I deleted the message. No response, no looking back. The next day, I met Amy and Mike for lunch, not bothering to mention the text. It wasn't worth it. Instead, we talked about plans for the weekend, about an upcoming concert we wanted to see, and about the possibility of taking a weekend trip together. There was an ease in our conversations that felt so natural, so... Right. As we laughed and joked over our burgers, I realized something important. I had spent so much time chasing after romantic connections that I had forgotten how fulfilling friendship could be. Amy and Mike weren't just friends in the casual sense. They were the kind of friends who showed up, who cared, who made life richer just by being in it. And in a way, I had been lucky that night at the pic, lucky that my disastrous date had led me to something so much better. Later that evening, as I walked back to my apartment, I felt a sense of peace wash over. The old me would have agonized over that text, wondering what it meant, what I should do. But now, I didn't care. I had learned that the people who truly matter are the ones who see you for who you are and stick around because of not in spite of it. And as I unlocked my door and stepped inside, I realized that maybe, just maybe, I wasn't as desperate as I'd once feared. I wasn't desperate for approval, for validation, or for a romantic relationship. What I was desperate for, what we're all desperate for, in some way, was connection. Real connection. And I had found that, even if it didn't come in the package I'd expected. Months passed, and life settled into a rhythm that I hadn't anticipated, but deeply appreciated. My connection with Amy and Mike continued to grow, weaving itself into the fabric of my everyday life. They weren't just the couple I randomly shared a picnic. They had become my closest friends. Our lives were intertwined in ways that I hadn't expected, and I found myself thinking back on how such a chance encounter had led to something so meaningful. One afternoon, as I sat at my kitchen table, I got a message from Mike. He and Amy were planning a small gathering at their apartment to celebrate their two-year anniversary of moving to the city. It was a casual event, just a few close friends, food, drinks, and laughter. Of course, I was invited, and I happily agreed to come. The invitation made me realize how much had changed since that fateful pic. Back then, I had been trying so hard to make someone like me to prove that I was worth getting to know. Now, I didn't have to try at all. These were people who had seen me at my most awkward, who had witnessed the desperate side, and they loved me anyway. The night of the party arrived, and I found myself walking through their familiar door, greeted by laughter and the smell of something delicious cooking in the kitchen. Amy hugged me as soon as I walked in, and Mike handed me a beer. It was easy, natural, 
like slipping into a warm, comfortable space that I didn't realize I had been missing. As the night went on, we all gathered in their small living room, swapping stories and reminiscing about old times. At some point, Amy decided to bring up the picnic story, much to my embarrassment. Do you guys know how we all became friends? She asked, her eyes twinkling with mischief. Mike grinned, clearly enjoying where this was headed. Oh man, this is a classic. I tried to cut in, hoping to steer the conversation elsewhere, but Amy was already too far in. So picture this, she said to the small, this guy, she pointed at me, puts together the most elaborate picnic you've ever seen for a first date. I'm talking candles, food from one of the best restaurants in the city, even cushions to sit on. And the girl just doesn't appreciate it, like at all. The group chuckled and I found myself laughing along, though I still felt a bit sheepish. It had taken a while to see the humor in it, but now I could laugh without feeling the sting of rejection. And when she calls it a desperate, Amy continued, her hands gesturing animatedly, this guy, our new best friend, doesn't get mad. No, he invites us over to eat the food instead. The room erupted in laughter, and I felt a warmth spread through me. They weren't laughing at me. But with the story had become a part of our shared history, a reminder of how our friendship had begun in the most unexpected way. Honestly, Mike chimed in, it was probably one of the best nights we've had in the city. We were broke on this cheap date, and suddenly we were having this incredible meal with a new friend. The group nodded, raising their glasses in a casual toast. Here's to the best failed date ever, someone said, and we all clinked glasses, the room filled with smiles. As the night wore on, I found myself reflecting on how far I had come since that day. It wasn't just about the picnic anymore. That failed date had been a turning point, one that had pushed me to look deeper at myself. I had spent so much time trying to live up to someone else's expectations that I forgot to check in with my own. The person I had been on that date, nervous, overthinking, trying to anticipate every little detail, wasn't who I was anymore. It was funny how something that had once felt so disastrous had turned out to be a blessing in disguise. The girl who had judged me for trying too hard, she had faded into the background of my memory. Nothing more than a lesson I'd learned along the way. But Amy and Mike, they were still here, still laughing, still reminding me that real connection wasn't something you had to force. It just happened when you were being yourself, when you let your guard down and allowed people in. Toward the end of the evening, after most of the guests had left, it was just the three of us sitting on their balcony, enjoying the quiet hum of the city in the distance. The conversation slowed, settling into that comfortable silence that only comes with people you trust. I found myself staring out at the skyline, feeling a deep sense of gratitude. You ever think about that night? I asked, breaking the silence. Mike chuckled. Pretty much every time we hang out, man. Amy nodded. Yeah, it was one of those random moments that just sticks with you. Like, we weren't even supposed to be at the park that... We were originally going to go to this concert, but our car broke down. I hadn't known that detail. Wait, seriously? Yep, Amy said, smiling at the memory. We were so bummed about it at the time, but now I wouldn't change it for the world. If we hadn't ended up at the park, we wouldn't have met you. I smiled, feeling a mix of humility and appreciation. Guess it all worked out, huh? It more than worked out, Mike added, clinking his beer against mine. We got a lifelong friend out of I didn't know what to say to that, so I just nodded, feeling a little choked up. It wasn't often that people made you feel this seen, this valued. And for the first time in a long time, I realized I didn't need validation from anyone else. Not from dates, not from fleeting connections. I had found something real, something solid. And it was more fulfilling than any romantic relationship could have been. As I left their apartment that night, walking through the city streets with a lightness in my step, I realized that life had a funny way of giving you exactly what you need, even if it's not what you expected. I had gone into that picnic thinking I would impress someone into like. Instead, I ended up impressing two strangers who became lifelong friends. It wasn't the story I had imagined, but it was better. It was real. And in the end, that was all that mattered.